Hey guys, my name is Ravi Sharma and I am the founder and buyer's agent here at Search Property. Thank you so much for joining me on yet another episode of Search Property TV. If you're new here or you haven't subscribed yet, please smash that subscribe button, hit the bell icon so you know when I'm dropping videos. And of course, give me a thumbs up if you like this sort of content. Now guys, before we kick through, I need you to go down, there's a link in the description, join the private Facebook group if you haven't already. Passive income and Australian real estate tips. I want you to be part of the community. I'm building out a community so that we can start leveraging everyone else's expertise, start bringing it all together so that you have an environment that's inviting to be actually able to talk about these things like financial independence, financial freedom, and personal investments. So guys, if you haven't already, smash that like button. Let's kick into the video. Today, buy versus rent. With interest rates being so low at the moment and predictions of it falling even further, we actually have an, a situation where basically it might be cheaper to actually buy a place versus renting. Now, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about pros and cons wise in both sort of scenarios, but something I want to address straight up from the start of this video is that people generally think it's the traditional way of thinking is that if you're renting, that's lost money. If you're renting, you're wasting money. You're paying someone else's mortgage. And that's what we grew up thinking. I'm the same and you know, some people that are watching still may think that. Uh, I have calls every day where I'm having this discussion around the fact that, hey, I'm not interested in renting or rent investing uh, because I don't wanna pay someone else's mortgage. If I can save that money and actually use it towards paying my own mortgage, well, that makes more sense to me. What I wanna go through here is the pros and cons very logical, keep it really realistic, and uh, also show you my point of view as to why I'm actually purchasing investments, but I continue to rent. Uh, especially during COVID, it's a unique opportunity, not only from the buying perspective, but also the renting perspective. So when we go through buying versus rent, it's easy to fall into the trap of going, no, renting's not for me. But I wanna go through the pros and cons so that you can keep an open mind about possibly this working out for you. So when we're renting, there are a few pros here. Keep your savings. So what I mean by keep your savings is that when you have to go purchase a property, you have to put in a 10 or 20% deposit. Now at the moment, if you're buying your own home and the government is backing your, you know, no LMI 5% deposit scheme, well then you only have to pay 5%. So you're putting 5% or 10% towards buying a property, which means that savings is now used to acquire assets, right? So now you may be asset rich, but your cash flow is a bit struggling here. It's a bit poor because you don't actually have access to that liquid money. So when we're looking at the pros of renting, well, you're renting on a week to week basis. So you're probably paying your rent either weekly, fortnightly or monthly. And so what that does is that means that you've got the assurance and the safety net of having 50, 60, $100,000 still sitting in your bank account. Now, for some people, they get addicted to the fact that they can save money and they go from, okay, 5,000 to 15,000 to 50,000, and it keeps going up, which means you have more of an incentive to hit the next goal. What this does is that it means that you're not deflated by having to use a large portion of that savings towards buying an asset. Now, of course, we're gonna explore other options and why there might be things you need to consider, but that's what I mean by freeing up your savings you have that money accessible. If something majorly happened in your life or you know, your parents or your brother or sister or partner or whatever needs to borrow like $10,000, you have that money there. Uh, whereas if you buy the property, it's in the property. Diversifying risk. Now guys, if you haven't seen in my other videos, I'm talking to people all the time about diversification, diversify your risk, because guys, at the end of the day, we are investing to create more choice. We're not investing to go, well, I'm gonna have more stresses and I'm gonna have more headaches and anxiety. I wanna create choice for myself and my family and provide in the future. So what that means is that we need to diversify our risk because if we have $100,000 or the life savings we've accumulated into one property, and this happens to be the property we purchase, well, now our risk is in one spot. So for instance, if you purchased in Sydney, uh, say earlier this year, You've had COVID happen and yes, prices haven't really fluctuated that much, but when you look at specific suburbs, they may have moved quite a bit. And so this is the stuff that the media doesn't report about 
but essentially you could be sitting in a property where the, the values have declined by maybe five or 10% this year and you can't do anything about it. It means that if something life-changing happened and you really needed that money, you couldn't sell that property for the price you paid for it. And that's a very scary prospect, especially for young people. When you're actually going through this journey, it needs to be active but passive at the same time. You wanna be growing your wealth, but still not have to forego all these other things in life that you can actually enjoy, like traveling, okay, COVID, but you can travel when things are opened again. You also have the freedom to actually live a different lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying you should go out and splurge your money and go out to clubs and things like that. That's part of growing up. And even for myself, when I was growing my portfolio, it was about how do I diversify risk, give me mind peace, peace of mind, um, and really understand that each part of the process is just another stepping stone. If I felt like I was putting six, $700 a week towards holding a property, uh, it didn't really make sense to me. So if you can diversify your risk, it means that you have access to more markets. So if we start looking at borderless investing, you might get one in Victoria, one in South Australia, one in New South Wales, You've now effectively gone, I can take advantage of different market cycles. And that in turn means I'm not relying on just one market to perform. Because if you end up sticking in a market that has done nothing, like Perth was doing for a period of like seven years, you now have choice because you chose to rent instead of purchasing a property. Cons, it could be more expensive. Now, this is where we are in 2020, 2021, depending on when you're watching this. The situation hasn't really changed with interest rates. We are at all time lows, we're gonna get lower and we have interest rates of now 2%, 2.2, 2.3%. So when you're actually purchasing a property and you do the simple numbers on a million dollar property, that's a 2% interest rate, you're paying $20,000 in interest. When you're dividing that across the year, that's like less than, you know, it's about four or 500 bucks a week. Now to rent a place that's a million dollars, uh, now it, it doesn't really work out. It's actually gonna be more expensive to rent. So straight away, people are going, well, interest rates are low. So we've now seen huge amounts of buyer activity around owner occupiers, people wanting to purchase their own place. However, they keep thinking, people keep thinking, and you might be one of these people, is that they keep thinking that if I purchase a house, it's an asset, it's a liability. And that's what we need to understand is that buying a house to live in is an emotional purchase and provides you no income, which means it's a liability. So in the current climate, it might be cheaper to actually purchase uh, than it is to actually rent. But I'll share my views at the end of this video. And of course, is why I'm still rent vesting and I think it gives me more choice. So I'll explain that at the end of the video. No forced savings. What I mean by no forced savings is that if you have a mortgage, you have to pay that off. Now, if you're in a principal and interest loan repayment scheme, that means you have to pay the interest, the cost of borrowing, but you also have to pay down that principal. It forces you into a habit to actually have to allocate that income towards paying down that debt. Now, effectively, that's another way to look at your savings. So if you're in a position where you actually haven't been a good saver, you aren't able to put 500 away every month or every week, well then this forces you into a position to actually do that, which means now it's taken out of your hand and you go, okay, well, I make my income, it's $1,000, and my expenses, well, my mortgage repayments is $600. Well, I'm taking that and I have to pay that first because I can tell you now, if you don't pay that, the bank's gonna come to you and say, what's up? <laughs> We've looked at the pros and cons of renting at a very high level. Now I'm gonna rub off this and we go with the opposite, which is buying a place and uh, what the pros and cons look like for that. Okay, so now cleaned off the board, we're now looking at the pros and cons of actually purchasing your property to live in. Now, when we go to the pros, stability is key. Now, I definitely understand this, personally renting myself. If the landlord actually only wants you in there for six or 12 months, that means every six to 12 months, you're gonna have to keep moving from place to place. Now, for some people, they want stability, especially if you've got like young kids, you've got a family, and you just like the lifestyle of, you know, living in a particular location, well, you're not gonna get that stability in living in that property because if the landlord decides he wants to get you out, he can get you out. Yes, he's gonna give you notice, but essentially he has all the power. Potential capital gains. Okay, so I say potential capital gains because it's not always that you just purchase a property and it's gonna go up in value. 
I hope the haters have been watching all the way through here because they always think that I'm some sort of property spruker where I'm all saying, hey, property's going up, you should purchase, you should purchase. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, when that's taken out of context, that's exactly what you're gonna hear. But what we need to know is context around what we're talking about. And I'm really going, hey, let's get some free education out there whether you use my service or not. So what I'm saying is that potential for capital gains is what I call hope, right? Now, if you're in a situation where you purchase a property in an area you like, you're gonna have an unbiased opinion going, well, no, that's actually a really nice place because I like living here. And if I like living here, other people do. And so it's gonna grow in value. The thing is that you may not be the right target market for that type of asset in this cycle. So of course, you know, you can go and watch some previous videos I've made about property cycles, but let's take Sydney, for example. If you're purchasing a property in Sydney and you go, okay, well, I'm ready to fork out a million dollars to purchase this property, well, it's going to grow because it's been growing at an average of, say, 7% over the last 10 or 15 years. It's going to continue. Well, we know if we've researched enough that growth is not linear. It doesn't grow 6% every single year, and that's how you can calculate it. It might grow 12% one year, goes down 2% the next year, may grow 6%. It's not linear. It averages out to be linear, but that's not how it works. So what we need to understand with this one is that just because you're purchasing the property and hoping there's gonna be capital growth, you have an unbiased opinion because you're emotional about that purchase, which means are you really looking at the growth fundamentals for that area? And are you looking at supply versus demand? Or are you looking at going, hey, I really love the kitchen. I'm, I think people will like it too. <laughs> Equity and leverage. What I mean by that, if you have been watching my videos, is that you can use the equity gain in a property as it grows over time and your debt's getting paid down or remains the same. You can use that equity to go and purchase another property without having to sell the property. So this is actually a really big hack in Australia real estate. And of course, you know, if you want to know a bit more about it, I can make a specific dedicated video about it. Just let me know in the comments down below. But essentially, we're using the equity on the property we purchased because we're hoping it's going up in value to then be able to go and purchase investments or things like that. Something that we need to point out here though is when we're doing this option, we have now have debt levels of like say eight, dollars $900,000. And now you're going to a bank and saying, hi bank, um, by the way, I wanna invest now. So can I take out some equity? And they'll go, yeah, your property's grown in value, but you don't actually have enough income to now satisfy the extra debt because you have a liability against your name because you make no income from that property. Now we're obviously gonna go jump on across this side and cover up the liability because your home is not an asset. It's, it's a debt trap, right? Um, most people will think that I'm oblivious to this, that I just want everyone to purchase property, but it's not the case. I'm being strategic about it and hence why I haven't purchased a property myself to actually live in. So what? we are seeing here is that if you find yourself in a position where you actually have equity growth and it's grown in value, what's to say that the bank's gonna to come to you and say, yeah, we're well, cool, we can borrow again and you can buy this investment, this investment, this investment. Because as much as you like to think that you can afford it, it's about cash flow. You need to satisfy two things here for the bank. That was four, but two things is enough. What you need to think is understand that there's cash flow that they're gonna assess in their servicing calculator. And then on this side, we're going to look at equity growth and capital to use as a deposit to purchase. Now, yes, if you're saving because interest rates are low, yes, your cash flow might be better. But unfortunately, you now have debt that's going to sit there and there's no income coming in to satisfy that debt. When they're putting in the buffers for the servicing calculators, you're not going to pass. So what you'll often see is people will go in and purchase their property and go, yes, yeah, so look, the first time buyer's grand and I own a property and I'm not renting like the other povos, like Ravi is, he's a povo, he's renting. I've got a property. Now I'm gonna increase my wealth because my property's grown in value. Now I go to the bank and I say, hey, hey bank, um, can I borrow some money? And they'll say, well, no, you can't because you've got a million dollars worth of debt here and you make no income from it. So now you can't invest. Now we flip over to the con side. The opportunity cost is massive. To understand this, we need to go a little bit deeper into like a servicing calculator. Essentially, what they're doing is they're putting buffers every time you have debt. That's, you know, buffering on how much income you make, buffering on how much rental income you make, and then buffering on, hey, interest rates are 2% at the moment, but we're gonna assess you at like 5%, right? So the opportunity cost is going, well, I can buy a property I like you know, to live in, 
it's going to cost me a million dollars. Let's just say. Now, for a million dollars, that means all of my savings goes into this one property. All of my debt is in one property, which means maximum exposure. And it also means that if I want to take advantage of what's happening in Tasmania or happening in Perth or Brisbane or Victoria, wherever, I can't do that because I'm now tied up in this one property in one location. So the opportunity cost here is I can purchase one, live in there and say, I've got a property. Or do we actually go and diversify that and purchase multiple properties, take advantage of multiple cycles and actually go about it that way? So for me personally, I'll share my strategy at the end of this video. We're almost there. So thank you for sticking out all the way. But I promise you, there's a golden nugget here of what I'm trying to do, and I think it could really help. And finally, risk. Risk is everything, guys. Liability and risk is massive, especially when you're growing a portfolio of considerable size. We've already seen during this year alone with COVID, we've had people that weren't great operators with business, weren't great operators with a property portfolio. They're suffering because their cash flow was not managed correctly. And so once you go into the fundamentals of building out a portfolio, you need to look at the foundations. Some people got lucky, they purchased a property and said, wow, okay, you know, I just rode the cycle and this is amazing, this is easy. And then they get to their second and their third when they're gonna have to purchase in the same location, they're realizing it's not that easy. And now to actually get out of it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So I would rather have risk exposed into different areas, right, at smaller values, being your two, three, four hundred thousand dollar properties that are taking care of themselves with good cash flow, positive cash flow, taking care of the repayments, versus one property that I get to live in and go, hey, you know what? If things go really bad in my life, do you think it's easier to sell the one million dollar property for a million dollars when everyone else is losing jobs? Or is it easier for you to go, I can't afford to rent here. Instead, I'm gonna downgrade and maybe I'll move two suburbs further out and get a place that's not as nice, but I can now save $300 a week. What's more likely to happen? You have the control in this scenario. You need the market to dictate terms if you can sell, because you need a buyer to actually purchase that property. So for me, it's not just about going wealth creation. It's about how do you mitigate risk, reduce your levels of risk? Why unnecessarily take that on to say, hey, I've got a property, look at me, look at me guys. That's like the whole concept that, you know, Gary Vee talks about is keeping up with the Joneses. It's like, because your family friend purchased a property, now you need to purchase one? Like if this strategy works for you and you're happier in life because now you get to take a 60K job versus a 120K job where you're never home, that's essentially what I'm saying. And for me, that's most important. Happiness is always the return on investment. And it's great that we can build wealth to give us choice but at the end of the day, we are not here to go and work ourselves to the ground and go, yes, money is everything and grow all these assets, but I'm always stressed out. There's no point to that. So for me personally, I'm rent vesting, which is meaning I'm renting somewhere, I purchase properties everywhere else. And with our research, we're identifying areas of growth. And so what we're able to do is go take advantage of those cycles. Those properties take care of themselves. So my debt goes up but it's taking care of it. So the bank will keep giving me money. And I can meanwhile, you know, maybe I live here for six months and then COVID happens and you go, okay, cool, I can't travel. But it means I can, maybe I'll live in a different part of Sydney. Maybe I'll move to Brisbane. Maybe I'll live on the Gold Coast for a while. It gives me more choice. And so that's the strategy I'm using. It's keeping me happy. It makes me feel alive when, I, you know, when I'm looking at the numbers, but it also means I can go to sleep at night not knowing, hey, oh my God, I've got like $3 million worth of debt. I'm screwed because I know that there's cash coming in for that and there's cash going out. Now I just need to manage my weekly budget to take care of where I rent. And that's pretty easy. If you've got the good savings habits, you'll be fine. But guys, thank you so much for watching all the way through. I want to bring you context, give you some value. And if you want more of this, the private Facebook group, Passive Income and Australian Real Estate Tips. There's a link in the description. Definitely come join that. If you haven't already subscribed, definitely do that as well here because I think you gonna love the channel. If you've watched all the way through, you definitely love this stuff, you want to learn some more, then subscribe to the channel, consider leaving a thumbs up so that other people like yourself can benefit from this. And of course, if you can do one thing for me, I want you to share it with one person. That's it, just one person, it's free. If there's any sort of value you've gotten out of this, 
just for the time, just for the fact that I'm sweating under this light. If you can share this to one person, that will make the world of difference because it means the people are getting the information they need. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thanks guys.